Michael, one of the core tensions uh, in science is between reductionism and emergence. Uh, I have followed it very carefully and thoroughly in the, in the world of physics and philosophy of mind. Uh -huh. um, but I've recently come to see that this tension also exists in philosophy of biology. So t tell me about it. What, what is the, um, the relationship between the, these ideas in biology? What are the different sides? And where do you come? Yes, I think that's a very good question because this picks up on the notion of two root metaphors or two paradigms, mm -hmm. if you like. On the one hand, the world is an organism. On the other hand, the world is a machine. Mm -hmm. Now, the world is a machine is going to be reductionistic because the way you understand things is by taking them to pieces mm -hmm. and looking at how the parts work. Uh, my favorite example is the Enigma machine mm -hmm. in the Second World War. Yeah, uh, code the, the Turing finally broke, as it yeah. were. Now, how did they do this? They, they, got a, they got an Enigma out of a submarine. They took it back. And what did they do? They didn't just look at it. <laughs> the first, it's immediately, they took it to bits. Yeah. And then they said, we've got all these bits. How do they work together? Yeah. And that is reductionism. Look at the parts and build up and see how the whole works for the whole. We're not against holes, mm. but we, we don't want holes to be some kind of mystical being mm -hmm. in their own right. Yeah. They are constructions yeah, from right. the bits and pieces. Whereas on the other hand, in the, the world as an organism starts with the whole organism, starts with the functioning Robert Kuhn, and then says, how do we understand how Robert Kuhn works? We, but we, all the time, it's Robert Kuhn, the working, functioning yes. human being, which is our, we've got in mind. And if we're gonna look at the parts, it doesn't mean we're not gonna look at the parts, but what we're always going to be doing is thinking of those parts in terms of the whole, rather than an ink machine, thinking of the whole in terms mm -hmm. of the parts. So I think that what you've got here is this example. Now, when I started philosophy of biology, yes, so we, we reductionists, people like me and David Hull and others, said, oh yes, obviously we want to start with molecules and then work up. As it happens, we didn't spend a lot of time on that, mainly because we, really, we soon learned that the problems of evolutionary biology in their own right were just all absorbing. And so we put in a quick chapter about reduction mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, molecular biology and then move on. I think it's been over the years that more and more philosophy of biology have started to take reduction seriously. And I think one of the reasons for this is evolutionary development or evo devo, mm -hmm. because suddenly we've learned that putting things together from the parts leads to the consequences and building up and, and so on. So, and what we've learned is that you don't need a million parts to get the embryo. It's a question of organization. Where are they in various places? Do we have A, B, B, A? Or do we have A, B, A, B, A, B? Or do we have A, B, C, A, B, C? And that's, so Evo Devo, I think, has made a big difference to the machine metaphor. We're still in the machine metaphor, but we're seeing, as it were, things coming out. Now, this, obviously, it's one thing to talk about the functioning of Robert Kuhn. It's another thing to think about the Robert Kuhn who lies there and says, oh my God, is the synthetic a priori really a priori? Or is, is causation really synthetic a priori? In other words, the thinking Robert Kuhn, I'll, I'll be nice. All right, the thinking Michael Roos. <laughs> okay, but you know what I mean. So we've got that one on one side, leave it for a moment. So on the other hand though, you've got the, the, the emergent, rather you've got the world as an organism people who are also thinking of these sorts of things. Now, they can't ignore molecular biology. They can't ignore molecular biology. But if you look at people like Steve Gould, who I think were always drawn to that side of things, what you see is Steve Gould is always pushing organization, always saying it's not just the parts, but it's the organization, which of course is holistic. You can't have organization if you've just got one thing. Sure. One thing is not organized. Two, perhaps, 10, and now we're getting organization. So I think what, what happens there is they're thinking more in terms of organization and then moving down to 
as it were, the genome, mm. and seeing and the emphasis on how they go. So in a way, obviously, it's the same world. It, we're not we're not Cunians here. We're not in, in, in commercial world. It's the same world. It's a question of how we approach them in that sort of thing. Now, I think this leads to some interesting questions about the body-mind problem. Now, let me be quite candid. Mm. We may be the cleverest people on earth, <laughs> but I don't think we've made any progress on the body-mind problem, mm -hmm. ever. <laughs> I mean, if you ask me, ask any of us, yeah. why do we think, oh yeah, we've all got good sophisticated answers, but I think deep down inside, yeah. what the, I won't use the word here, because yeah. you probably would censor me, but what, what's going on here? Why are we able to think? And of course, what you see is various sorts of positions. And so on the, on the uh, world as a machine position, you get somebody like Dan Dennett, who basically is a materialist. Sure. And Dennett wants not, to not say- basically, fundamentally. Yeah, yeah fundamentally. <laughs> what to say, all this talk about minds is, you know, poppycock. Mm. You know, it's all, it's a question of molecules in motion. Mm. That's what it is, mm -hmm. that's what it is. And then on the other hand, you've got the orga or organistic types who, at some level, want to say it's an emergent, it's holistic, it come, you, it, it's holistic. So what you've got is molecules, but not just molecules, but molecules organized this sort of way like that. And suddenly, bingo, you know, they like that, and then bingo, you get the right organization, and you're thinking. I think my position, and I don't think I'm the only one, who says somehow neither of these positions really work. I mean, we are more than just material. Yeah. When you're thinking, oh my God, is the categorical imperative synthetic a priori? <laughs> you may be wasting your time. <laughs> you may not be wasting your time. But the point is, you're not just, what shall I say, eating, breathing, going to the lavatory. You're thinking. You know? So in other words, there's something more going on than just the material. I mean, Dan Dennett can go on all he likes, but he's wrong. <laughs> but on the other hand, Emergentism, I, I don't think I'm the only one, basically sounds, here we are, we've got everything together, and then suddenly a miracle occurs. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know that joke about, you know, when the chap's writing, Sam Harris is it, uh, writing the, you know, writing the, the formulae on the, on, the, uh, on the wall, on the desk, or on the blackboard, and suddenly he said, and then a miracle occurs. Yeah. And the other chap says, well, uh, maybe, but that's not really an explanation. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt, and I don't think I'm alone in this, I've always felt that somehow emergence is, and then a miracle occurs. Well, um, um, the, the concept is that um, it, uh, emergent phenomena, what I like to call weak or strong. Weak is that we can't explain how it happens. Yeah. But in principle, perhaps we can. Yeah. Strong emergence is that even in principle, we're not able to, ex we'll never be able to explain, no matter how sophisticated our science, yeah. and what it, that, and what that and is. As far as I'm concerned. And you're calling that, a, that's the miracle. Yeah, and I, as far as I'm concerned, it's strong emergence is where I'm at or something like that. Now, having presented these two positions, inevitably, I've got something to say in the middle, <laughs> as you're probably gathering. <laughs> and, and, this, and it's not me. It goes back to the 19th century, and one or two of them said, you know, if we're evolutionists, if we believe that Darwin is right about evolution, then at some point we start with molecules. Molecules who are not obviously thinking. I mean, you know, or even amoeba, don't, you know, oysters. I mean, here's, here's a good one. Philip, you know, uh, what is it, Singer, Peter Singer, you know, is, won't, you know, is against eating animals and that sort of thing. He eats oysters. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he says they're non-sentient. They're not thinking beings. They're just, mm -hmm. as it were, vegetables and shells. Mm -hmm. you know? So he, he doesn't mind eating oysters. Mm -hmm. But then there comes a point where you get to crabs <laughs> where he does mind, strongly objects. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is somehow consciousness is, I use the word emerging, but I'm not using it in a philosophical yeah, yeah, sense. Yeah. What I'm saying is it's coming into being yeah. as we go until we get up to the, the highest form of human being, namely the philosophers. philosophers. <laughs> okay. so, so what does this mean? It means possibly then there's no break. That's, that's the whole thing about evolutionary theory. It's a continuum. You, you know, for all that Steve Gould talked about, punctuated equilibrium, it's not right to know. It's, it's always 
going up smoothly or going going up sometimes going back but it's always going smoothly as no it? no big step functions. right that's right and so what a number of people have been arguing then is that this surely points to the fact that consciousness doesn't suddenly start to exist at some level weird though it may sound sounds odd to say the molecules are conscious but at another level, you have to say that. Now, this is known as you know, panpsychic monism. <laughs> monism, you see, yeah. Spinoza, who wants to say everything yeah. is both mind and matter at the same time. Well, the, the more pompous word that we use these days yeah. is panpsychic monism. In other words, somehow, it, now, I don't, I mean, I think this gives you a kind of ontological picture of what's going on. I don't think it explains it, why this happened. So if, if, if I give you that, and, and panpsychism yeah. and panpsychic monism is a, a, an increasingly popular way of explaining, uh, dealing with the mind-body problem and explaining consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So if that were the case, is there any other application of that in biology and life other than the mind-body problem and consciousness? Well, I think, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because I don't know it's the same thing, but I think... Again, a number of us are realizing that J.B.S. Haldane, the yeah, population yeah. geneticist, said, not only is the world queerer than we think it is, yes. it's queerer than we could think it is. Yeah, yes. And I grew up as a Quaker, and of course, Quakers are very much into some kind of mysticism. They, they, it's called apathetic theology. Uh, you can say what well, God is not. Right. You can't say what God is. So I'm Although I, I don't really believe in God, I'm, I'm an agnostic on that. I, at some level, that makes sense to me. And there are things that I simply don't understand, like quantum entanglement. How is it that something happening on one side of, of the universe has not, you know, in 10 minutes, not caused by, but it happens here and it happens there at the same time? Now, yeah, you tell me. All I can say is, not only a hell of a lot queerer than I think it is, it's a hell of a lot queerer than I could think it is. So for me, panpsychic monism, if I say it leads to a certain modesty, don't try to laugh too loud. <laughs> but I think you've already realized modesty is not one of the platonic forms in which I participate a great deal. But, but at some level, that's where I'm at. Hmm.